G'day everyone and welcome to this webinar to discuss managing Queensland fruit fly. So this webinar has become particularly timely uh, given the apparent interest um, in today's discussion from participants. So this is also including a couple of recent detections of Q fly in Tasmania and a spike of the detection in South Australia, um, as well as some understanding of some expansions as well in locations across Victoria. So my name is uh, Clinton Muller. I work with RM Consulting Group and we're coordinating the Australian Strawberry Industry Research and Development Extension Program for Innovation. Uh, and I'm also joined by my colleague with Queensland Strawberry Growers Association, Ken Rowling, uh, the Subtropical Industry Development Officer for the industry. So Strawberry Innovation is funded by the Strawberry Levy Fund uh, with co-contributors from the Australian Government and managed through Hort Innovation for Growers. So today uh, we'll be discussing the behaviour and control options and management of fruit fly in strawberries. And on the line, we have the great pleasure of being joined by Dan Papacek and Paul Jones from Bugs for Bugs, uh, as well as a late but uh, very welcome addition from Brett Jackson, the Principal Biosecurity Officer for the Capricorna region, Biosecurity Queensland. So a bit of housekeeping for those who may not have uh, joined a webinar before. Uh, this session is live right now, but we are recording it and will be made available on the Strawberry Innovation website to anybody who's interested in watching the session. Uh, but for those who are joining us right here, right now, we really do encourage you to participate uh, and really welcome your questions. What I'd say is you'll note a uh, panel box on the right-hand side of your screen and there's a chat option there. So as a question comes to mind, feel free just to jot, jot down what your thoughts are and questions, anyone particularly you might want to direct it to. Any major or burning questions, I'll make sure we address at the end of each presenter, uh, but otherwise we might save them up for a bit of Q&A discussion at the end. So the format for today's session is we're going to hear from uh, Dan Papacek first on some of the behavioural and biological aspects of QFly, as well as some control and management options, uh, and learn more from Dan's more than 40 years experience uh, with working in integrated pest management, including uh, some experience from tree crops and as that might be relevant to strawberries. We'll then hear from Paul Jones to give us a bit of our update locally and experiences from particularly the last season uh, and some of the lessons that have been encountered there, controlling and managing Queensland fruit fly. Uh, and very timely, Brett Jackson uh, join us at the end. Just to give a bit of a, a broad update and perspective of what's happening at the moment across uh, the country. Uh, just, just broadly, I can't talk to too much um, in other states given he is Queensland based, but he will share some information on the spike of fruit fly detections in the Adelaide market uh, associated with mango uh, transport to the Adelaide market and implications that may have for strawberry growers. So look, really welcome everyone's attendance today. I might open the floor to Dan to kick us off with proceedings uh, and give us a presentation update of fruit fly from his perspective. All right, All right. well, uh, welcome everybody. I've never done a uh, webinar before, so it'll be a bit of a learning experience. And um, I hope that uh, I can just share with you some of my experience in managing fruit fly at a practical level with growers in uh, Queensland. Most of my experience was originally with citrus, but then with other tree crops. Strawberries, of course, have a special place because they are, you know, a ground-based crop, and so I'll try and cover some information about that at the end of my thoughts on that. So just launching off, I guess um, the. Uh, what's going on here? There we go. The, um, the important thing is that we understand the enemy and fruit fly is uh, certainly a very serious threat. And it's a, a nasty pest that's endemic to this part of the world. The, um, there's no doubt that it can cause a great deal of crop loss. And this image here shows clearly what can go wrong if, if growers don't attend to their fruit fly management the way they should. Um, we, I guess we believe and we promote a concept of a systems approach. And this simply means that we use a series of measures which work together to give us the best possible outcome. And the, the aim should always be to optimize every aspect of our fruit fly management. And I guess 
the other message I like to get across when I'm talking to growers is that it's possible to get very, very good fruit fly control if you do do everything correctly. Now, again, I, I want to be careful here that I don't, um, well, well that I, you know, strawberries are obviously a special case. And so my understanding is that we'll have to work a little bit to understand the best way to get the most out of fruit fly management in that crop. But I do believe that the principles that I present here are applicable across all crops. And that if we sort of follow these principles, that we should be able to get an excellent result. So as part of this, we really need to understand more about the biology and the behavior of the pest so that we can target these aspects and get the best possible outcome. So a little bit about the life cycle, I guess, of fruit fly. Um, eggs are laid into fruit and uh, often you get this sort of gummy egg today. Certainly in uh, some of the crops like citrus and stone fruits, this is pretty clear. Um, less so, of course, in something like strawberries. Um, the process of egg laying actually introduces bacteria and fungi that lead to a rot, and that rot gives off a smell which is often identified with fruit fly activity. And um, the other important thing, of course, is that unlike many other tests, fruit fly very much focus on healthy fruit. So this is healthy maturing fruit on the tree or on the vine. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about why it's not such a big deal in fruit that's been harvested, maybe later if, if we have time. The eggs hatch within a few days. And the larvae, which uh, develop quickly on the rotting flesh, um, are feed feed and, uh, and start to grow very quickly within the fruit. Now the, the bacteria that I mentioned, the bacteria and fungi that uh, are injected at the time of egg laying actually help to decompose the fruit and make, make it more um, digestible, I guess, for the fruit fly larvae. In time, and I'm talking about tree crops now, the fruit will drop to the ground and the larvae will leave the fruit, that rotting fruit, to pupate in the soil. Adult flies, which emerge from the pupae that have developed in the soil, can live for quite a long time. They're capable of traveling some distance. And it's an important thing to note that the female fruit fly does need to feed on protein before she can lay eggs. So there's a time period between which, from, or after which, when she emerges, before she's even capable of causing damage. And in that time frame, and this is several days, around about five days, um, she must have a feed of protein. And it's, it's this behavioral feature that is the focus of much of our attention. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. It's also important to understand that male flies themselves do seek protein also, but this, this requirement of the female to, for her eggs to mature, to have a protein feed is very important in the way we manage this pest. Now the, uh, the two sexes do behave differently and some of our strategies to control fruit fly are targeting these different, different behavioral attributes of the two sexes. Uh, can everybody hear me okay, by the way? Yeah, Paul, you're coming through very loud. Sorry, man. Now, is that, that's coming through loud and clear? I've just had no sort of feedback. And I just want to make sure it's all going according to plan. No, everyone's on mute at the moment. Um, but if anyone's got any audio problems, feel free just to drop in comments. And Nathan, yeah, no, Roy, come on. all good, Dan. Cheers. Okay, good. All right, so now these are a list of some of the tools that we have available to manage fruit fly. And these aren't in any particular order, although you'll see I do group them uh, as, as uh, the ones that I guess more readily available to us. So protein bait sprays. Um, monitoring, male annihilation. And don't worry too much about the detail here. I will expand on some of these, especially the ones that are more relevant to sort of day-to-day -day use. Sanitation, of course. Um, there's post-harvest uh, things we can do in the management of fruit fly. Crop management aspects. Um, the use of thickness, um, physical controls, cover sprays, biological control, something we call sterile insect technique. And, um, and that's, the, that's the list of um, tools we've got available. I'll just briefly cover off on cover sprays. Now, 
unfortunately, I think, um, I say unfortunately, maybe you might think fortunately, but for many, many years we've had some extremely effective uh, insecticides that have been very uh, um, readily available and that have done a great job in controlling fruit fly. And to some extent, the problem is that we've lost the, the technology that's been around some time that I'm about to talk about, and that's the use of, say, bait sprays and other technologies such as MAT. Now, these cover sprays include some of the organophosphates such as the methylate, fenthine, and trichlorophon. All of these products were really quite effective in their own way, but as we know, they're being phased out, and the loss of these products, of course, has led to something of a crisis in fruit fly management. And I guess my mission is to try and help growers understand that we do have other ways of managing fruit fly. So these other ways are very, very effective. And um, and we really have to learn to manage without without cover sprays because um, they're, simply, they're simply becoming unavailable. And um, it's almost amazing to me that for so many years, uh, we actually managed to get away with uh, putting sort of pretty serious toxicants on edible fruit almost immediately before it was being consumed, that's just an aside. Okay, so our systems approach that we, um, we advocate really consists of the four components in that lineup of tools that I mentioned earlier. And of course, I'm talking about protein bait sprays, monitoring, male inhalation and sanitation. Um, these other strategies there, such as SIT and biological control, they're all of interest to us, but they're not really readily available to growers at this stage. And so I won't dwell on them at all because of the lack of time. But if anybody's interested in finding out more about these, I'll be very happy to discuss them one-on-one um, -on -one at any time. So just uh, one by one, I guess, protein bait sprays. Now, I. Usually when I'm talking to a group of growers, I try to get across the message that protein baiting is really is the nuts and bolts of fruit fly management. And uh, I would say that, you know, we I, I would consider this to be sort of like 85%, if you like, of our entire fruit fly management is protein baiting. So I guess the message is that if you get, if you're gonna get anything right, make sure you get your protein baiting sorted, because this is really, this is really what's giving you the lion's share of the control of fruit fly and the other tools are add-ons to try to sort of clean up what we didn't manage to, to achieve with protein baiting and get us sort of, you know, from 85 to 100% of fruit fly control if you like. Now, I mentioned earlier that the adult flies emerge from the soil after they've completed their pupil development. The females need to feed on protein before they can lay, can lay eggs. I'm just reiterating this because it's such an important feature of the, their biology and behavior. And that we have a period of, say, almost a week after the fruit flies emerge freshly from the soil before they can even start to cause any damage to fruit. And in that time, the female must have a, a protein feed. Now, the obvious question, I guess, is in nature, where did they get their protein? And the answer is that by hunting around in amongst the crop, whether it was a citrus tree or avocados or rainforest, and searching high and low for scraps of protein, which could have come from bird droppings or bacteria or fungal growth. And the truth is, of course, that this represents quite a bit of energy expenditure. So fruit flies would would search in amongst the foliage of the host tree to seek out enough protein to allow maturation of the eggs. And um, I think um, the point is that this is, involves quite a bit of hard work. They've got to do a lot of hunting around and they only get small scraps of, of a proteinaceous, proteinaceous source. And it takes quite a while for them to consume enough protein to, to allow egg development. And we are offering them a, a very nice protein feed that's very accessible when we pl apply our protein bait spray. And, and that's why it's, it's a very effective technique. So in, uh, I guess in a sense, I'd sort of suggest that if for instance, Clinton I was to offer you um, a feed by putting a bag of wheat and just spreading it over an acre of ground, you could hunt around and pick up those grains of wheat and you would eventually get enough 
to sort of maintain sustenance. But if I was to stick a hamburger on a post in the middle of that acre of ground, you'd go straight for it because that's so, so much easier and it involves so much less work and effort to give you such a greater reward. And that's the, that's the basis of protein baiting. I hope you understand what I'm trying to get across here, but, but we're providing a really good, nice feed uh, readily available on a regular basis. And so fruit flies are very, very attracted to it. And it's so much easier and less energy expended to them the alternative, which is which is hunting around in lots of foliage. So a little bit more about the whole technique of protein baiting. Um, the important things are that, that you really must start early. And the, the idea here is to, is to start to get the protein out regularly in the crop before fruit fly becomes established in the crop. And that means before fruit becomes susceptible. Now, in some crops such as citrus, we normally think of colour break as a time where, where um, we really have to be protein invading well and truly in advance of that. Um, I, I won't speculate too much on strawberries at this stage, but obviously, you know, anytime you've got any colour in your fruit, you're at risk. And so I would suggest that very quite early in the, in the crop development that you need to be thinking about protein invading. Um, the other thing that we need to stress here is that applications are, you know, should be regular and that may be once, twice or even three times a week depending on fruit fly pressure and uh, climatic conditions, etc. It's important never to miss a treatment because it's the, it's the regular application of the protein that's taking out the fruit fly before they have time to complete their um, development of their ovaries and eggs. And um, it's not good enough to sort of fail to put on a treatment one week simply because they're pretty busy doing other jobs. So, so being religious with your application is, is a very important aspect of fruit flight management. Um, in tree crops, we've always recommended that the protein is applied onto the foliage or trunk of the tree. Now, obviously, that's not applicable for strawberries, and I'll try and give some thoughts on what might be best in your situation. Um, but we, in, a, in, a, in an orchard situation, we don't like to apply it directly to the ground or the grass because that's simply not, not going to deliver. And the other thing, of course, is that if we are going through periods of rain or showery weather, we simply have to put on the protein base more or frequently because um, rain will, will wash it off and render it ineffective. Uh, and the other thing is, of course, is that when you mix it up, you need to apply it pretty quickly. In other words, get it out while it's fresh because it's a uh, biologically active product and it will soon uh, start to ferment and become less attractive. In much the same way as if uh, that hamburger I mentioned earlier, if I put that on the post in the middle of one acre of ground, uh, it's going to be pretty attractive to you, Clinton, for the first hour or so, but after three days, it's going to be rather uninteresting and you might choose to ignore it. Now, in strawberries, I would be thinking seriously about developing windbreaks or something similar for low-grown crops such as strawberries, but again, I'll just toss some thoughts in a bit later about what might make most sense here. Now, the, the, just the, uh, the other things to realise about protein baiting is that they're a spot treatment. It's a protein plus a toxicant, so it's, it works much better, in much the same way a cockroach bait works in the kitchen. We're using a food source to attract the insect to feed and we're including a toxicant which takes it out. And, and this is why it's sort of, um, it's considered to be a targeted application of an insecticide and it's much less disruptive and it's very, very compatible with an IPM approach. It's a true attract and kill approach. And in tree crops, of course, there are many different ways of putting out the protein. And these are just some images that will give you a bit of an idea. These, these are uh, small tanks that um, can uh, put out a coarse spray and the unit moves along quite quickly. Typically, you know, a speed up to 20 kilometres an hour and uh, it's not all that uh, unusual for our growers to be able to treat sort of 20 hectares an hour. So it's a pretty quick and simple operation once you get the hang of it, in, in certainly in the tree crops. Now, monitoring is another one of the tools in our toolbox. Um, the, uh, the four that I mentioned as part of our systems approach. And monitoring is all about catching and counting fruit flies. And we use these sort of traps and we have a, a male sex attractant in an impregnated wick, the flies come into the trap and then we can, we can just keep a record of activity. And this helps us sort of get a feel for how our control's going and also gives us a bit of a handle on what the population's doing. 
these traps are specific only to the males. But it's very important to remember as well that the information we gain from trap counts is, is really about population trend monitoring. And you have to be very, very careful not to um, misinterpret the information. So it doesn't really matter whether you're catching 20 or 50 or even 200 flies in a trap. What sort of matters more is whether it's, it's sort of remaining stable, going up or going down. It's also important to understand that the number of male flies we catch in a trap has poor correlation with the propensity for damage. So just because you're getting males in a trap doesn't mean you're getting damage. And conversely, if you're not catching a lot of males, it doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to get damage either. So you have to treat traps as a sort of a useful aid, but not something that you want to place too much weight on. You certainly don't ever want to say, all right, I'll stop baiting for the next couple of weeks because I'm not catching a lot of flies in the trap. That's, that's a, a, um, something you should never, you should never fall into that, um, uh, into that uh, trap, I guess, of, of, of suspecting that, that you, you're, everything's good because you're not catching a lot of flies. Um, look, there's been a lot of work done over many years to develop a female trap. There's been quite a few efforts, especially in the last two or three or four years or more, um, but the truth is that, that we still don't have an effective female trap and at this stage there's nothing that really quite measures up to uh, fresh, regularly applied protein baiting as a way to manage the female population. Now monitoring also is much more than just checking male flies in a trap. And it, it's all about um, having a good look at your crop in the field on a regular basis. And um, for, you know, this would be at least maybe twice a week at critical times of the year, perhaps. And you're looking for things like adult flies uh, being active in the crop and also any evidence of stinging. Now, the truth is, of course, that if you're, if you're managing your fruit fly population well, using the sort of principles of uh, systems approach, you should see neither of the above. In other words, we shouldn't be getting uh, adult flies about and we shouldn't be getting any stinging. So it is possible to get extremely good results if, if everything is done correctly. Now, the, uh, the third tool in our toolbox is this concept of male annihilation, and uh, or an MAT, we call it, male annihilation, annihilation technology. Um, the whole idea is to apply the principle of the male trap and use that to, so we put out essentially a whole lot more of these uh, male pheromone traps per hectare to suppress the male fly population. It's been an invaluable tool in our area-wide management approach. And there are um, a few different sort of styles out there at the moment. Um, this one here is uh, something called an amulet. And this is, this is one, uh, an MAT that we've developed, which has got an impregnated wick here. and then. The, the uh, one in the middle is, uh, is a new product that's, um, that's also uh, aimed at this male fly uh, annihilation approach. And the, the concept is that um, if we get enough of these out per hectare and we keep the pressure up, we can reduce the male population and hence, hence have a downward pressure on the, on the fly population as a whole. The truth is that this, this is a very, very effective tool, but it's not a standalone technology. It's only something we use as an add-on to the protein baiting and to the monitoring and also to the practices of good sanitation. And our experience has been that this is also something that works best over larger areas and that it, um, it also gives a cumulative effect over time. So as we bring the male population down and we keep pressure on that population by repeating the application of these MATs over the season, we gradually bring down the population pressure on the population which gives us ultimately our best possible fruit fly management. Um, so there are, you know, in the, uh, the MATs available, we've got three colours out there. We put them out at 10 to 20 per hectare depending on the things like the sensitivity of the crop and the, uh, uh, the pressure from fruit fly. At this stage, we suggest they get put out spring, summer and autumn and we leave them out there for a full 12 months. So we we're effectively getting an accumulative dose over time. And each unit has maximum effective effectiveness for about three months, but they do start to decay over a period of time. 
they will work for up to eight months or more, and we've often even had them 12 months or older that are still helping to, to kill male flies. And as I mentioned earlier, they work, or this whole approach works best in larger farms or as part of an area-wide management. So the more growers in an area that are practicing um, first, uh, you know, best practice fruit fly management, the better result all will have. And it, it's very much the case with, with all approach to fruit fly management that the, the wider the area treated, the more growers participating, the better the results. And that's something I really want to stress. Now, the sanitation is the fourth in my list of um, readily available tools that we can use as part of our systems approach. And by sanitation, I guess I'm, I'm talking about um, things like ensuring that fruit aren't left. Now, in, a, in, a, in an orchard situation, you can imagine that, that if fruit are left hanging after harvest and they're not treated, that that represents uh, a, a real risk in terms of opportunities to fruit fly to breed in the crop. And so harvest early if possible and remove fallen fruit <coughs> is, a, is another part of the approach. Um, the truth is that, that fruit on the ground after harvest are a relatively low risk from fruit fly. Fruit fly are mostly interested in fruit that are still on the, you know, on the host plant. Uh, so just reiterating that systems approach, we're talking about several components that we use together in an integrated approach to get best practice fruit fly management. They include monitoring protein bait sprays, male annihilation, and sanitation. Sanitation is not so much about burying fruit and things like that, it's more about being wise with regard to potential for fruit to be damaged in the field and ensuring you don't leave opportunities for fruit fly to breed in your crop or in your environment. Um, how are we going for time, Clinton? Oh, we've got a couple more minutes, Dan, if you want to start um, wrapping up with the case study from Table Grapes. Yeah. All right. Well, look, I, that's where I'm up to. This will only take a couple of minutes and then I'll just do a quick... Yeah, so I could keep going with this. Look, I just want to point out that uh, our early work was all focused on tree crops. When we were looking at incorporating grapes into our fruit fly management, we had to rethink a little bit. And um, at first, and I was a little bit sceptical about you know the sort of the extent of the control we'd get, um, but just so just to give you a bit of an idea, this is an applicator that was designed for grapes. You can see I don't know if you can tell from here, but the, the protein bait is actually just streaming upwards rather than sideways. This is mainly because we wanted to avoid getting it directly on the on the grapes themselves, of course. And here's an applicator going up in the rows, and the protein bait is just sort of dripping down on top of the vines. Uh, and this just shows you the, uh, the machine in action here. Once again, this is very, very quick and simple operation. Here's some of the, um, the bait that's sort of settled on the leaves and, um, um, pro and the fruit fly are highly attracted to this. And then at the end of each row uh, is a matte cup. And when, you know, we found uh, within, in fact, here's a, an example of the sort of results. These arrows, on this graph here are indications of applications of dimethylate. And um, this was common practice in grapes to manage fruit fly was, you know, in this case, we've got five applications of dimethylate in the season. And the year after we introduced the systems approach to fruit fly management, um, there's no, there was no um, requirement for fruit fly cover sprays. And this was pretty dramatic sort of change for the industry. So I think it just gives you an example of a little bit of lateral thinking and what can be achieved in different industries. And then just to give you some ideas, um, I think that in low growing crops like strawberries, that ultimately the best results we're gonna get is if we, you know, where we can apply the bait to vertical plants such as, and this is an example of a, of a windbreak grass and around here you've got windbreak trees and this is just to get you thinking about ways you might modify your growing practices to provide opportunities to get the bait uh, close to the strawberry plants. The problem, with, the problem with strawberries is that while fruit fly will travel to a strawberry to attack um, a beautiful ripe piece of fruit, they tend not to want to stay in and around strawberry plants down at ground level. And they tend to roost nearby in, in more elevated crops and, um, and host trees. 
And so we sort of need to think about getting our protein bait up at, at that uh, sort of um, shrub or, or lower tree height level. And uh, there's another example here. I don't know if you can see this, but on either side of this um, vegetable crop, you can sort of see that there are uh, windbreak uh, grasses. And these uh, opportunities, you know, in a case like this, you could easily put a bait spray, run along and put a bait spray along um, this windbreak here. And it needs to be relatively close uh, so that the fruit fly don't have to travel very far to pick up a protein bait, but um, at a height that sort of more in, it suits their biology and behaviour. Look, I'll just uh, finish off at that and um, hand back over to you, Clinton. That's just sort of, you know, a bit of an overview of some of the principles of fruit fly management and how we've applied them in other crops, I guess, and maybe a little bit of thought about what might be better used for strawberries. Fantastic. Thanks, for that, Dan. Look, I think that was a great um, summary. I know particularly myself took a couple of key points there on the management. Um, so just to recap, to check my notes are correct, is that uh, protein baiting is fundamental, important for fruit fly management. I like the hamburger on the post analogy personally. Uh, the importance of yeah. uh, monitoring indicators of uh, population trends. So not just um, trapping, but also ensuring regular field and not to be disheartened if you're not finding anything. That's a great sign in itself. Uh, and also that yeah. annihilation technology is effective, but uh, should not be used as a standalone management tool. That's right, yep. Fantastic. Well, look, appreciate that, Dan. If there's any particular questions to Dan's great summary and overview of uh, fruit fly management and control options, please feel free to shoot them through on questions. I've got one just here through from uh, Nathan Roy, who might just deal with now, Dan. Uh, he asked if fruit fly go to the dump piles of fruit. So picking up on some of your comments around sanitation. To the, is, it, is that to the dump holes you're talking about? Yeah, so stockpiles of fruit on farm, uh, would that be an attractive yeah. to fruit yeah, that's a That's a very good question, Nathan. And the answer is basically no. Um, now, that's a little bit simplistic, but the truth is that fruit fly are very attracted to fruit that are on the vine or on the tree, and they're not terribly interested in fruit that, are, that have been harvested. And that doesn't mean that it could never happen. And if you had a particularly high fruit fly population, then there is always a risk. But our experience has been that once, once fruit are harvested, in fact, even pulling fruit off a tree and putting it on the ground renders it almost unattractive to fruit flies. So I think the, the, the point is that if, if fruit are on the ground because they've either been knocked off with hail or they've been um, maybe uh, as part of the harvest process, if they're on the ground for those sort of reasons, they re represent a low risk. If fruit are on the ground because of fruit fly. In other words, fruit fly has stung that fruit and it's on the ground. That's a totally different story. And, and that represents quite a risk. But the truth is that if you're doing everything right and you've got your fruit fly management sorted, you shouldn't ever get fruit being stung. And, and our mission is to make sure that we simply don't get stung fruit in the first place. Does that make sense? Fantastic. Look, appreciate that, Dan. Uh, so if there's any other questions for Dan or any of the other panellists, please feel free to just jot them down in questions and we'll deal with them as they come through. Uh, Paul, if I might put you on the spot to um, give a bit of an update from your perspective on um, some of that local happening in relation to fruit fly. Yeah, thanks, Clinton. Thanks, Dan, for the, for the rundown. Yeah, look, uh, in general, strawberries I would consider to be a, a minor host pest for fruit fly, um, but however, each year, particularly around mid-September onwards, we do get fruit fly strikes. And I'd have to say 2017 was perhaps one of, one of the worst years we'd ever experienced fruit fly. Um, asked us, we always ask the question why, and it's hard to answer other than the fact that um, we get an intense warm period, um, probably towards the end of August, coming in September. And as Dan was saying, probably a week after the fruit flies emerged, we, we get hit with, with um, fruit fly stings. Um, 
perhaps a big problem that time of year as well. And this year might have been a bit more unique, being a bit warmer. There's a lot of aroma, a lot of strawberries around, a lot of aroma. There's no other host for the fruit fly to sting. And hence it's sort of um, our desperate attempt of um, trying a continuous life cycle where it went down the strawberries low on the ground. Um, again, we asked the question, why was it worse this year than other years? It, it's hard to explain why. Perhaps uh, a lot more strawberries grown in Queensland this year. There was a lot of patches that were abandoned early and perhaps that uh, provided a, a good source of um, fruit fly to develop and then spread further. So probably probably one of the from the outcome from last season is as soon as you finish the patch of strawberries to spray them out ASAP, otherwise um, it potentially only caused problems to other patches. So yeah, look, um, it was an interesting year. I believe a lot of growers had fruit that was condemned as a result of fruit fly stings. Um, there's, a lot of, there's quite a few cover sprays applied. Um, again, that sort of just illustrates the problem we do have with um, available chemistry. We don't have uh, dimethoate anymore um, and we have other products which um, don't have that systemic properties that the dimethoate have, so it controls a lot harder. So future-wise, um, we have to work, we're going to have to take in a lot of what Dan has said and work m much more on a, a better means of controlling our fruit fly. Probably our biggest, um, probably one of the biggest trends we're going to see in the future in Queensland is um, changing the way we grow strawberries and it appears that bench tops is going to become more of a um, popular means to grow strawberries. That being the case, um, fruit fly is going to be a much greater problem and this last season it certainly proved to be the case where substantial crop losses were a result of bench top strawberries, strawberries growing on benches on a koi mix about a metre above the ground. Now fruit fly sees that pretty much like a tree crop, so it could have, to it, it was like a nice soft stone fruit or something like that, so it, it hence it become very, very attractive to the fruit fly. So we're going to go down the bench top system, bench top mains of growing strawberries, we're pretty much going to have to start a baiting, a strict baiting program virtually from day one of planting and following the program, the strategies which Dan has recommended, you know, using baits, mat lures, um, a strict hygiene approach, sanitation, sanitation approach to growing the berries. Um, so yeah, so for the future, I do see that fruit fly is kind of become a greater issue for strawberries. The trend is um, all pointing that direction due to the lack of. Um, available chemistry for cover sprays, effective chemistry and the way we mean the means we grow crops. Uh, due to the large amount of strawberries grown, there's perhaps going to be a lot more if the crop isn't um, destroyed, it's certainly going to be a potential host for large amounts of fruit flies as well. So we're really for the future we're going to have to become a lot more aware how we do how we attack our fruit fly. Generally in the past we've got the fields, as I said um, prior to say September, mid and September fruit flies barely a problem. A lot of growers have put into practice a margin baiting and placing and placing uh, mat lures around. It has been useful, however um, without the assistance of cover sprays, um, once you get into late August, early September we start to get warm weather events, the fruit fly risk is quite high, so it is certainly going to be a challenge in the future. So yeah, now for southern, southern states, bench tops is also going to be a challenge as well. Um, we have fruit fly in Victoria now, so and the trend is to growing strawberries on benches. And just recently the um, incursion of fruit fly in Tasmania will also make um, the crop quite quite attractive to fruit fly purely because it's elevated above the ground and it's the ideal height. So trend is um, going down the bench system, trend will be um, growing a crop that is going to be far more fruit fly susceptible than what it has been in the past. So that's that's pretty much the cover of the season. Um, main thing is towards the end of the season tends to be a lot more overripe fruit that attracts a fruit fly, hygiene is essential. 
prices are low, so it, it tends to make it harder to keep the crop, crop clean. But if we are going to grow, grow strawberries in Queensland September into October, we have to put in a much more stricter hygiene measures, um, much more um, a better means of um, removing crops as soon as possible, and also look at the, some of the ideas that Dan has proposed, say um, growing um, crop stands within the rows to be able to apply the bait onto the crop. So yeah, so that's pretty much it in a nutshell with Queensland. Um, what was considered to be a relatively minor pest, I believe, is becoming more and more of a, a major pest for the future, purely because we're lacking the chemistry which we've had in the past to control um, fruit fly towards the end of the season. So I might leave it at that, Clint, unless someone's got some questions. We do have a question that's come through. Um, I'll let either yourself, Paul, or Dan handle this one. Uh, so the questions come through around native citruses and particularly finger limes. Um, and wondering whether they're susceptible to fruit fly, uh, the same as imported varieties of citrus. Yeah, look, generally, generally much, much less so. In fact, um, the, uh, the highly cultivated varieties, which are um, high in sugars and uh, are, are far more susceptible to fruit fly. We've sort of created our own problem in a sense by developing these uh, um, very uh, sweet, and um, heavy cropping varieties. So the answer is, I, I wouldn't be terribly concerned about things like finger limes as a um, as a host for fruit fly. Uh, the, the greater problem comes from our cultivated crops, and certainly in um, in areas where strawberries are grown, if you've got, for instance, uh, stone fruit nearby, that represents a huge risk. Now, because stone fruit, of course, are very very high on the on the priorities for fruit fly. So that, that, that's where you want to have more of your focus. I think also I like to get across the message that while fruit fly is quite a mobile pest and that it's, um, it's, it's, it's absolutely the case that area-wide management works best, but it's also something that I like to encourage growers to think of it as a residential pest. In other words, don't, don't give up and think you can't do a good job simply because someone down the road is not doing a particularly good job. If you get everything right on your property and you've got a reasonable size commercial operation, it's, it's surprising what a good result you can achieve. But, you know, I think that's an important message. Don't sort of assume that you won't do a good job, but it's very important that you um, tackle the thing uh, properly and professionally. And if you do so, you can achieve a very good result. And I think also that I would, I'm a little bit concerned that in general, the strawberry industry has sort of for a long time been of the notion that it's not a particularly favored host for a fruit fly. And that historically has been true, but that's also changing rapidly. I think it's clear that fruit fly has expanded its range significantly in the last few years. And there are many reasons for that. Partly, I guess, we've expanded our horticultural production areas, but more importantly, we, we simply have to acknowledge that the climate has changed, it's continuing to change, and it's changing to the benefit of the fruit fly. We're, we're finding that winters aren't as cold as they used to be, they aren't as, the duration isn't as long as they once were. We're often getting uh, unseasonal rain events. So in other words, at times of the year, when, and I'm thinking of the southern states now, there's rain occurring at times when it formerly did not happen very often. And all of these things can, um, can help fruit fly greatly increase its range. And I think also strawberries now, I, I really think strawberry growers have to consider fruit fly as a, as a significant pest problem that they have to manage properly, not to sort of pretend that it's not really a problem, it's only occasional incidental thing, and that it's, 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 it's sort of um, not to be taken seriously. That's just my my thoughts on the matter. Fantastic. Look, thanks for that, Dan. And uh, thanks again, Paul, for that presentation. I think that's a really interesting insight in terms of uh, production changes that are occurring across industry uh, and a good reminder and timely as well about things to look out for. Uh, I might just the last few um, Ten, last 10, 15 minutes we've got on the line, uh, invite Brett Jackson uh, from Queensland Biosecurity. 
just give a bit of an update on um, some of the protocols for interstate movement of Queensland strawberries, particularly to the South Australian market, um, given the spike in detections that has been seen within the Adelaide market. Uh, and anything more broadly he can comment on in relation to some of the recent um, incursions that have been picked up. So I'll leave it with you, Brett. Thanks, Brett, and I'll just uh, check everyone can hear me. So, Brett, your microphone is a little bit faint. If there's a chance you can come closer to the microphone. Uh, that would... That's all right, mate. I'll just take my uh, earphones out. If that's any better? Yeah, a little bit better, thanks. All right, no worries. Um, look, thanks very much for, uh, for the opportunity to have a quick chat. Um, look, I'll first, uh, firstly, I'll head off with the uh, the Queensland fruit fly detections in mangoes that have recently uh, been in the media. Um, people may have heard the Queensland Country Hour on Tuesday that went into some detail in relation to those detections that we had. Um, unfortunately, we are undertaking two investigations currently in relation to those detections. Um, since 2013, um, we've had four detections all up in uh, mangoes into interstate uh, markets. Unfortunately, since December last year, we've actually had four uh, within the last two months. So um, there's been a been somewhat of a spike in detections into the Adelaide market. Um, unfortunately, that's um, uh, you know left um, products down there requiring some sort of alternative. Uh, treatment, which is kind of investigation to actually have those um, those products accepted by the South Australians, which is um, not the most um, not the easiest thing to do. Um, but so BQ is currently working with um, with the mango industry in far north Queensland to uh, to sort of deal with what potential um, uh, breaks in that protocol were this season, um, and that's obviously ongoing. So unfortunately, um, with that comes um, what we're finding in the Adelaide market at the moment is a heightened awareness um, in relation to Queensland fruit fly. And in, in, in matter of fact, both Mediterranean fruit fly from Western Australia and Queensland fruit fly from the Eastern Seaboards. Uh, so not only at the government level, but at also at a retail level. So consumers have been the uh, the, the main um, um, notifiers of Queensland fruit fly and product. Um, which have been made it quite difficult to undertake trace back because, uh, as you can probably understand, it's very hard to try and trace one piece of fruit um, back to a particular consignment that a grower sent down there. So um, that's a continuing uh, issue that we have with that. Um, so effectively, what effect does that have on strawberry growers? Well, unfortunately, like I just mentioned, that it increases awareness of uh, of fruit fly in uh, in the in non fruit fly markets. Um, unfortunately, for Queensland strawberry growers, we have had two detections of, of Queensland fruit fly and strawberry fruit over the last two years. And uh, like Paul was mentioning uh, beforehand, um, both of those detections have been in fruit that has been uh, picked and packed in that last half of September within days of each other, um, 12 months apart. So um, from looking at that, that sort of uh, um, scenario, we, we are also seeing an issue at that sort of uh, last application of 6S NEO as part of the uh, ICA 34 operational procedure. Um, it's a particular risk to the industry and um, we're just um, asking for heightened vigilance at that time of year. Strawberry down into the Adelaide market. Um, um, as, as Dan and Paul have already mentioned, and um, as we will mention as well, is that um, we are finding that not only the strawberry industry, but all fruit fly host industries are, um, do not have access to, or are losing access to many of the, the historical cover sprays that were out there. So I'd be hoping that most of those uh, strawberry growers who um, are part of ICA 34 accreditation or previously um, Dan's systems based approach is nothing new to them um, for ICA 34 accredited businesses um, because obviously uh, that ICA 34 protocol takes into account a lot of those systems based approaches um, that Dan and Paul um, have previously uh, indicated and talked about. So from here, uh, I guess taking that into account is that we really, um, the industry as a whole really need to protect the protocol that is based uh, around the ICA 34, um, taking into account the alternative chemicals sitting the wings to use for cover sprays. Um, and, uh, and um, you know, but, but in, in, in the background, 
is that BQ is ready to you know negotiate if we do have uh, increased incidence of free uh, fruit fly in strawberries into the Adelaide market. Um, we also have you know industry and um, the access to the uh, market access group at, at uh, AgriScience Queensland who are there are ready to assist if needed if um if you know if we do see uh, increased incidence of fruit fly. Fantastic. Look, appreciate that, Brett, and some good updates there on the protocols. Were there any questions outstanding for any of the presenters, either Dan or Paul from Bugs to Bugs or uh, Brett from Biosecurity Queensland? Uh, look, we have nothing um, coming through right now, so given that it's close to the hour, I might draw this one to a close. There's nothing like finishing on a bit of an early mark. Uh, but look, really want to extend appreciation to both Dan and Paul from Bugs and Bugs uh, and also Brett uh, for joining us and agreeing to just this afternoon. Um, but look, really appreciate your contribution, the update to this issue for the industry that is continuing to become a more apparent and emerging priority. Uh, and look, we will share this recording up on the Strawberry Innovation uh, website and also make a available to all participants who have registered for today's session. Uh, we hope you found it informative uh, and always open to suggestions of future webinar topics. So I'd really encourage uh, anybody who might have any ideas for future uh, conversation topics for the Strawberry Innovation Project to get in touch with either uh, Jen Rowling uh, as the Subtropical Industry Development Officer or Angela Atkinson in the Temperate Region or um, ourselves at RMCG. We look, really want to thank everyone for their time today and contribution. Uh, and please feel free to get back to us with any further comments. But with that, I might draw us to a close uh, and look forward to talking with everyone again soon. So thanks everyone.